I will look at form, deform, transform. So I will teach the gospel. I'm not going to preach the gospel, but I will teach the gospel. The gospel ought to be understood. So I will take time and teach the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, and verse 14. I want you to get your Bibles close to you. So I'm going to teach so that you join me as we move along. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, all peoples, and then the end will come. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ was talking to the disciples about the signs of the end of the time. And then he made this submarine statement that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wash cold. But in the midst of all that, this gospel of the kingdom should be preached in the whole world as a testimony, as a testimony, as evidence in support that Jesus actually came to die for mankind. This gospel must be preached in the whole world, in the whole world. Now, so in this talk, I'll try to open up the gospel and establish the fact that the gospel is an exclusive gospel. Then I will dwell extensively on why the redemption story ought to be told. And I'll offer four ways this gospel of the kingdom should be handled. Now the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Scripture says that God did not bring his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Brothers and sisters, it cost God, his son, to save this world. So when we say that God so loved the world, it is not so cheap. Many a time, when we are talking about issues about LGBTQ, people will say that love, you see, God loves. But the love of God is not that cheap. It's not that cheap. The fact that God is love does not mean that he tolerates everything and anything. No. The love of God cost him his son. Now, the forgiveness of our sins cost God his only begotten son. It is only in believing in his son that one sin will, one sins will be forgiven. Otherwise, not. The love of God is so expensive. Don't let us joke with it. It is only in believing it's in, in his only begotten son that one ought to be saved. Otherwise, not. First John chapter 2, verse 2 says this. First John 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Those of us who are born again. And scripture says that not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. What does this scripture really mean. Now let's go to Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Romans 3, 23 and then I'll add 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then the next verse says this. And all are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
Now, what is going on? Verse 23 is saying that all have sinned. Then the next verse says that all have been justified freely through Jesus Christ. There seems to be some missing link. And the verse 25 and 26 will supply the gap. So let's go to verse 25 and 26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, God's own righteousness, because in his forbearance, he has left the sins committed beforehand and punished. Now, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his own righteousness because in his forbearance, he has left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Now, forbearance is abstaining from the enforcement of a right of punishing the sinner to eternal condemnation. God decided that, no, don't let me punish the sinner to eternal condemnation. I will make a plan for their redemption. And he says that that plan is supposed to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. What is the scripture trying to say? Why was this demonstration important or necessary? See, God has many attributes. God is not only love. God is also a holy God. So whilst the love of God is trying to ask mankind, the sinner, to come to him, the holiness of God rejects that idea. No. The holiness of God cannot contain the sinner. The faithfulness of God is saying that the soul that sins shall die. And the mercy of God is pleading for the sinner. Now, so what does he do? In his wisdom, he takes a plan or he makes a plan. He presents Christ to be received by faith. So that if the sinner does not receive Christ by faith, then he has his own self to be blamed. So if the sinner receives Jesus by faith, then the blood of Christ cleanses the sinner. That appeases his holiness and his justice and his faithfulness. So his love and his mercy cannot draw the sinner to God, reconcile him unto God. If the sinner rejects this, then he has himself to be blamed. So let me take verse 25 and 26 again. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he has left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Let it wait for a while. What is he going to do? Verse 26 says that he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to justify, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So this is God's demonstration. He has presented Christ to be received by faith. Now, let's go to verse 21 of the same chapter. Chapter 3 of Rom Romans. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Now, so now verse 23 says that, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then verse 24 says that, 
Whoever believes in the Son of God is going to be justified. Is going to be justified. Hold that close to your chest. So this is how God packaged salvation. And he backed it with an oath. God decided that this is how I'm going to save mankind. But he backed it with an oath. Now when we talk about oath, the oath is supposed to settle all arguments. Now oath is a solemn appeal to a deity or to some revered person or a thing, someone or something that is greater, to witness one's determination to speak the truth and to keep a promise. That is oath. Now, so when you go to the court and you are a Christian and you are going to testify, they will want you to swear an oath. So you lift the Bible and then you swear. If you are a Muslim, they will give you the Quran. If you don't want any of the two, then you affirm. Now, when you do that, you are trying to tell the whole world that what you are going to say is the truth. Now, I want you to read, let's read Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. From verse 16. We may read together if you can see the screens. People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and put an end to all arguments. So oath are supposed to put an end to all what? Arguments. Verse 17. Verse 17. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear, to the ends of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. So that those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ will be so sure that we are saved. So God confirmed what he did with an oath. Verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of, this, of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Now, if God swore, how did he do it? Because if you have to take an oath, you have to swear to someone greater than yourself. So let's go to verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 6. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. So there is nobody greater for God to swear by. So he swears by himself. By himself. Say, I swear by myself. But God gave a testimony. So God took an oath. He swore by himself that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now let's go and listen to God's testimony about his son. So if God has sworn, let's listen to his testimony about the son and the fact that he is the Savior of the world. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verse, from verse 9. First John 5, verse 9. We accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. So God has given a testimony about his son. And scripture is saying that we all accept man's testimony. Then we should try and accept God's testimony. And this is the testimony God has given about his son. So let's move on to the next verse. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, in, be, does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. The next verse is a big one. And this is the testimony. You see the column? 
it means that he's going to tell us the testimony that actually God actually gave about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, comma, and this life is in his son, full stop. That is all. God has given us, the whole world, eternal life. And this life is in his son, full stop. Jesus Christ is not a founder of a certain religion called Christianity. Jesus Christ is a savior of the world. Jesus Christ is a savior of the world. This is God's own testimony. Not my testimony. And he has he made this testimony on the oath. And because he has done that on the oath, nothing to, will be able to change it. It is settled. Now the next verse. Verse 12. Shall we read together? Whoever has the son has. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have full stop. That's all. This is God's testimony. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Full stop. If you are here and your daddy does not have the son of God, your dad does not have eternal life. You need to do something about it. But introduce Jesus Christ to him. Otherwise not. Otherwise, he is making God a liar. And God will not accept that. This story, this arrangement must be told. That is why Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom must be told, must be preached in the whole world as a testimony. Then the end will come. We should go about telling this good news that God has made an arrangement for any unbeliever. If you believe in the Son, you'll be saved. If you don't believe in the Son, you will not be saved. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Are we together? The sinner ought to be confronted with this gospel. The gospel must be preached. The gospel must be preached. What is gospel? Ordinarily, when something or a statement is referred to as a gospel... We mean something regarded as true and implicitly believed. Now, gospel is able, is gospel is also a doctrine regarded as of prime importance and ought to be, ought not to be altered, as you say. When we say gospel, it's something that is regarded or a doctrine that is regarded as of prime importance and it ought not to be altered. That is the gospel. Now when Christians say that gospel, what do we really mean? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When we say gospel, what do we mean? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, verse 3. I want all of us to lift our hands and then find the screen and watch the screen. So, what do we mean by the gospel? For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. I've, I've said that when we say gospel, we mean something that is of great importance. First importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the word scriptures means law. See, when God was sending out Joshua, he says, this book of the law. Now, the, what we hold as a Bible is law. And then scripture is saying that, let's go back to verse 3. For what I have received, I pass on to you as of first important, that Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. The next verse, verse 4. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. This one is the gospel. By believing in this, you have believed the testimony that God has given about his son. And scripture says that if you do that, you are saved. Otherwise, not. And this gospel, I have said that God has sworn an oath and backed the fact that salvation is found only in his son, Jesus Christ. Salvation is not found in any other but in Jesus Christ. Four things that we ought to do with the gospel. Number one, the gospel ought to be preserved. It shouldn't be altered. Number two, the gospel ought to be preached. Number three, the gospel ought to be taught like I'm trying to teach the gospel. Number four, the gospel ought to be demonstrated with signs and wonders following. Now, let me take the first one. The gospel must be preserved. For the purpose of this occasion, I may dwell on the fact that the gospel ought to be preserved and the fact that the gospel ought to be preached. After all, I'm teaching the gospel. When I talk about the name Jesus, I'll, we will demonstrate the gospel when I talk about the name Jesus. But let's discuss the fact that the gospel ought to be preserved. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Now, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. A different gospel. Verse 8, verse 7. Which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8. Now, I want any of us that can read from the screen. We want to shout this one. Ready, go. But we, now let's start, ready, go. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we, let them be under God's curse. Why? Why is he saying that? Now he's saying that even if we, Paul inclusive, we come to you to preach to you another gospel. The gospel is simple, that Christ died, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And this is the testimony God has given about his son. And the apostle Paul is saying that if anyone comes to preach a different gospel, even if we, Paul inclusive, or an angel, Michael, Gabriel, and all others that we don't know their names, should preach a gospel other than the one we have preached to you, let them be under God's curse. Why? The simple reason is this. Because God has backed his testimony with oath. And no human being, no angel, no demon should change it. It is settled. That is why scripture says forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled. It is settled. No one should change it. No additives. It's a problem these days that our churches, the way we are conducting it, it's, it's so worrisome. Worrisome. Now, the old hymn says this. My faith has found a resting place, not in device, nor creed. I trust the earth, 
by living one. His wounds for me shall bleed. I need no argument. I need no rather plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for. It is enough that Jesus died. It is enough. No additives. No anointing oil. No water from Jordan. No tokens. It is enough. If Jesus cannot save you, no oil on this earth can save you. It is enough. This is the gospel. No additives. I want to encourage you. If you have any oil in your bag, Go and throw it away. Just get close to Jesus. The church we are building today is weak because we have added so many things. Jesus is enough for us. He is enough for us. These days, when you give a, a huge offering, some pastors will have to wash your feet with oil. Where from all this? Jesus is enough. I want you to stand up for a moment. We are going to pray. I'm happy that I'm talking to you. Young people who have strength to be able to push the church. This generation of Christians should stick to the gospel, the simple gospel. Nothing else, nothing more. This is God's testimony. What else do you need to add? It works. Let's lift up our hands and lift the church of God in this country before him. Let us pray that God sanctify your church. Let us stay with the simple gospel of Christ. Shall we pray together? Now listen. God did not just make the statement. Please stand for a moment. The son and the right to be the savior of the world. He gained it as due return. And I want all of us to stand listening to this. That Jesus Christ and the right to become the, the savior of the world. And God gave a testimony to back it. Philippians 2, Philippians 2, from verse 5. I want us to stand reading. Philippians 2, from verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being the very nature of God, they do not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Now look at how he's coming down. Rather, he made himself what? Nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now let's move on. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on the cross. Now listen the son gained the right by what he did. Now let's go, let's read the next verse. Verse 9. Therefore, now as a result of what he did, King James will say that God also exalted him to the highest place and gave him what? Not a name, but the name that is above every name. Now listen. He earned it. God has given him 
the name that is above every name. Now pay attention to the next verse. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now it's the first one that surprises me. Kneels in heaven. Kneels in heaven. On earth and under the earth. Verse 11. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Shall we put our hands together for Jesus? He gained it. He gained it. And then, God has given proof to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world by one action, just one action. We will take that before we sit down, please. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Acts 17, 31. Some of you, you, are, you want to put down something, but let's read together. Ready, go. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, not a man, the man he has appointed through his testimony and on oath. He has given proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, God has given proof of this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. Now, give me a name of any religious guru that you know who was raised from the dead and I will take this scripture out from the Bible. If you give me one person, any name that you know, any leader, founder of any religion, claiming to be a savior, if you give me one who died and was raised from the dead, then we will say that God's testimony is a lie. I'm waiting. You give me one. You see, people who do not believe in their religion and they know that it is not strong, normally they will say that every religion leads to God. But this one is exclusive. Christianity is an exclusive religion because we have exclusive message. We are saying that Without Jesus, no life. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. Now, he is either a lunatic or he knows what he's saying. Shall we lift up our hands and begin to bless the name of the Lord? Let's lift Jesus higher. He is the savior of the world. Not a founder of a religion. Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. Oh, Lama Son, de 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 I'm wonderful, yeah. Let somebody come and help me. Please have your seat. Hallelujah. we are on some nations 
have used governmental laws to shield their people from being convicted. They say that in this country, you don't convert anybody. You know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of the gospel of salvation. Let them remove the laws and their people will run to Jesus. I am praying today that I keep, as I keep saying these things, may these spiritual laws be broken. That the gospel will be able to penetrate every nation. Now if there is right for every religion, why is it that when somebody scores a goal on a football field and the person lifts his jersey and under his jersey he has written Jesus Christ boldly and people say that it's an offense. But in a football match, captains are permitted to put on LGBT band. And all of us are looking on. We think that it is okay. You know what they are afraid of? They are afraid of the gospel of Christ. And this thing is not against a church. It is against our Christ. Young people. Young people. These barriers ought to be broken. These barriers ought to be broken. These barriers ought to be broken. Because he that has the son has life. He that has not the son of God does not have life. If this testimony of God is true, then this gospel of the kingdom ought to be preached. It ought to be preached unto the whole world. Then the end will come. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul. For it is the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jews and then to all the others. Now, I'll have... Do an illustration and then for the sake of time, I'll ask somebody to come and do the altar call. Your man come. The two of you. Okay. So you are in black. Normally we say Satan, he likes black things. So. And so other red. So hold on to this one. Hold, I mean, like you, he is under your claws, your authority. This young man is a drunkard. He's doing all, all sort of evil. He is under the power of the devil. The devil is having a hold on him because there is no preacher. There is no gospel. But let there be a gospel preacher. My friend, come Then he preaches the gospel to this young man. And then he makes an invitation. He throws an invitation to him to come to Jesus. Yes. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Then leave him alone. Now listen. There is nothing that disarms the enemy so easily than the gospel. All of us, we were sinners. But what brought us here? The gospel. If the devil was strong, why did he leave us when the gospel was preached to us? That is why Paul says that it is the power of God unto salvation. If we don't preach this gospel of the kingdom, people will go to hell. And if we preach it, we will depopulate hell. The gospel ought to be preached. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now, if you are here and you don't know Jesus as Lord, I want you to give your life to him. Because this gospel ought to be preached. When we are preaching the gospel, it means we are lifting him up. And the Bible says that I, if I'm lifted up, says Jesus, I will draw all men unto myself so let's continue to lift him up through the preaching of the gospel and hell will be depopulated now this evening if you want to give your life to Jesus 
that will be the best thing that can ever happen to you. If you want to give your life to Jesus. I'm going to hand over the mic to Dr. Uh, Jimmy Marking. <laughs> 